Recognize the government house leader. Thank you very much, Speaker, for uh, recognizing me to uh, speak um, on Bill 73, the Smart Growth for Our Communities Act, which was tabled by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, um, um, who I had the uh, the honor of uh, uh, joining when the minister um, uh, introduced the bill along with um, his parliamentary assistant, uh, uh, the member from um, Northumberland, Quinty West. I remember that. And Speaker, I, uh, I stand here uh, to speak on this very important issue around land use planning in my capacity, my very important responsibility. In fact, as a member of Provincial Parliament for Ottawa Centre, I have, uh, Speaker, since uh, 2007, an incredible privilege of representing my community on Ottawa Centre. Those of you who have had the opportunity to, uh, to be in my writing, and I hope that's every single member in the House because I have the most uh, rare, unique opportunity of representing downtown Ottawa in our nation's capital with, with national institutions like the House of Commons and Senate of Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada, the Bank of Canada, and many national museums, some, uh, something that everyone should come and, and visit. Um, I've had the amazing opportunity, Speaker, to work with my community on some very important issues as we work together to grow our community and make it even more livable uh, and, and healthy uh, for, um, for all members of our community. One of the issues, Speaker, that I've been quite actively been working with my community since, uh, I would say, since 2009 or so, is the issue around land use planning is the issue around development in our community and the challenges at times that come up with that development if it is not done right. Uh, my community, given that it is a downtown community, um, is, um, is, is uh, home to many desirable neighborhoods uh, uh, that are sought after in, across the city. I would, uh, I would say with all due respect to all the members from Ottawa area, you will see neighborhoods like the Glebe, the Westboro, Hintonburg, uh, Carlton Heights, uh, Centertown, um, Carlington, Mechanicsville. Um, all these neighborhoods, Speaker, are absolutely just growing. They're growing with young families moving in, buying their first home. Um, they're growing with a lot of um, what we call colloquially say empty nesters, uh, uh, couples who, whose kids have grown up, have now gone to university or have uh, their own homes or jobs, uh, downsizing, coming to downtown and perhaps uh, moving into uh, condominiums. That's another big development you see in my communities. I often call them vertical neighborhoods, uh, condominium buildings being, being developed. But with that intensification, which is very much welcomed in my community, uh, speaker comes challenges around how that, that development is taking place, to what extent a community is engaged and involved in that, in that development, and how we are working together to ensure that the development that is taking place in our community is being done so in a manner that it keeps the, 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 the fabric and the character of our neighborhoods. That's something, one, one of the things that my constituents often talk about is making sure the development we are having um, really maintains that, that fabric, uh, that tradition, the values of our neighborhoods because uh, neighborhoods uh, in my community go, uh, go over 100, 150 years since sort of the, the building of the Rideau Canal and the Bytown and of course the development that took place that is now uh, uh, city of Ottawa. So as a result of, 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 of that Tension at times, uh, Speaker, I've been quite engaged with my community and working along with them in developing the next steps to ensure that the process of development, the process around land use planning is that, that brings everybody together, brings the developers and the community and the municipality together so that we can work together in, in creating what we refer to in my community as community-inspired development. Uh, where everybody is, is working together so that uh, the intensification that is taking place is something that we can all enjoy and live with. 
As a result of uh, many conversations and meetings and consultations with our community associations, with neighbors and friends, speaker in my writing, um, in, in, in the election of 2011, I came up with a very concrete proposal as to how can we, um, if we can have community inspired um, a development. And there were, there were four things that I proposed uh, on behalf of the community. And I had committed to the community that if I'm elected that I will work on those things uh, that I wanted to very quickly highlight. One uh, sp uh, speaker was to change the Planning Act to require municipalities to adopt completed community design plans into their official plans, something that our community spent a lot of time developing these CDPs or community design plans to make sure that they actually become part of official plans as, as sort of secondary plans so that everybody has the, the predictability and certainty around what has been what has been decided as a community that includes developers as well. Um, another proposal that I had put forward uh, as part of our community inspired development uh, proposal uh, speaker was that we ensure decisions of the city council around official plans are respected by the OMB. Many times communities feel that OMB overrules those decisions um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, elected representatives in city council uh, sometimes lose their voice. Uh, thirdly, that we impose mandatory mediation in all development appeals as opposed to the adversarial process that exists. And lastly, Speaker, introduce anti-slap legislation to protect the participation of individuals and, and community groups advocating or speaking out on these and other issues. Speaker, since my election, uh, re-election in 2011, I've been very actively working on all those four aspects. And I'm really happy, uh, Speaker, to see that Bill 73 uh, adopts uh, many of those suggestions that my community and I made in, in that process. As for the anti-slap bill, Speaker, I uh, took the step of introducing Bill 132 in uh, October of 2012 as a private member's bill uh, to have the uh, legislation around strategic litigation against public participation. And I'm very excited, Speaker, to note that that voice and the will of my community expressed through Bill 132 was then adopted by the government by means of Bill 52, which is being debated in this House as well. I am hopeful that will became will become law in this session through the support of all members um, in the House. But the other three elements has been has been uh, something that we've been discussing and I've been advocating um, to the community. As a result, Speaker, in 2012, I hosted a community consultation. Something that I do is called Sustainable Community Summit, where we take uh, different topics that are important to sort of our downtown urban and needs. Um, we had over 100 people came to that consultation with some excellent presentation as to how can we reform our land use planning system. We had presentation speaker, and I do want to mention these individuals because they're very active in my community, from people um, like um, Jay Bells uh, of the Hinterberg Community Association who had done extensive work on OMB process, was actually part also of the, um, the, uh, uh, the adjustment committee. At the, at the city as well. We um, had Janry Cohen, who's a development lawyer with Solarite LLP, who brought in the protect, pr practitioner's perspective into the conversation. And we also had a developer, Neil Malhotra, who's the vice president of Claridge Homes, who very candidly uh, offered developers' point of view as to the, the, the planning that goes on behalf of developers um, when they are proposing projects. That robust conversation, Speaker, resulted in a report that we tabled to then Minister of Municipal Affairs and uh, Housing, the current Premier of Ontario, um, uh, uh, to sort of undertake where we, we canvass very candidly issues like, should we just maintain the status quo? Uh, should we create local appeal boards as opposed to OMBs to look at decisions? Should we enhance community-inspired development, something that I had proposed uh, and we see so uh, reflected in Bill 73? Uh, and should we dissolve OMB? And I have to tell you that an overwhelming response by the members of my community was against, number one, in maintaining the status quo because they felt that something's broken needs to be fixed and against dissolving the OMB. They felt that OMB has an important role as a quasi-judicial tribunal, uh, an arm's length body which is, which is not government, it's a court-like body with expertise. Uh, rules maybe have to look at, but it's important to keep that body in place. But really sort of focusing on that what we need is more community-based development. We need more community voices in that development uh, uh, process. Let me just highlight, share with you, Speaker, 
a uh, couple of things that my community said, which we, we, we noted in our report. Uh, and the minister, if you want a, a refresher copy of the report, I'd be more than happy to share with you uh, again as well. Um, no, I, 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 I'm not being facetious. It's actually, it's, it's a, uh, if I may so, it's a very extensive report, really captures uh, uh, the views of my community from a downtown perspective. Very thoughtful conversation that, that took place, looking at a variety of, uh, of, of options and, and, and discussing that with the help of some experts in the room. One, one of the participant members of my community said that the OMB works. The problem is at the level of city official plan, zoning, and a commitment to, wor uh, to working the official plan zoning. Another participant said in, the, in that consultation, it's not about the OMB, but about how communities and citizens are able to communicate perspectives and valuable opinions into the official plan and CDPs. That's just two examples where people very strongly talked about that how we can improve the system by making sure that community voices are present at the discussion when um, a, a, a proposal is put forward by a developer and then that proposal works through the system through the city level. I'm of the view, Speaker, that if we can have better conversation, if we have better feedback at that initial stage, you will eliminate majority of OMB appeals right from the get-go. The reason OMB appeals takes place because something got broken in the front end, where people were not talking, well, projects were being rammed through, uh, either through the developer or, or at the city council, and somebody's unhappy. And that unhappiness then reflects in the, in the appeal process. So that is why I'm so excited about uh, Bill 73, because this is exactly what this bill achieves to do. It, makes the citizen engagement piece uh, an integral part, a mandate, mandated part through legislation from the, uh, from the moment uh, a proposal is put forward and then all the way uh, to the OMB process if you get that far. So the fact that we are now requiring um, and that I think speaks to the community inspired development that now that we're requiring the city uh, 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 councils or city planners to have citizen engagement as part of the official plan. The fact that this bill requires that developers must consult with the communities when they put forward proposals and then shall, the language is mandatory, then shall respond to that and reflect changes accordingly. The fact that we now require the city council or city planning committee also considers community feedback and make sure that the developer actually respond uh, to that is an important step um, and then report back on that and then taking that thread further uh, that if the matter does go to OMB then making sure that OMB also gives regard to that process. I think that's a, that's a very sensible move and something that has been appreciated in my community. In fact, Speaker, I will say to you since, since that we have uh, tabled this legislation many communities and developers are now working together and already starting to do that because they realize, hopefully, that this bill will be passed with the, with the permission of uh, all the members, but this is the right thing to do. And we're starting to see development take place in the community. Right. Speaker, that where, where in the past people did not speak to each other, where community did not speak with the developers or vice versa, they're actually walking hand in hand because they are talking to each other and, they're, uh, and they are uh, influencing each other. I'll give you the example of Old Ottawa East, also a neighborhood in my, in my community where there's whole new development is starting to take place on Oblis land. So it was church land, it was beautiful green space with heritage buildings. Church had to sell uh, the building. But city, city made sure that they engage in a community design plan that was very consultative in nature. And the developers who bought the lands made sure that they worked with the local community association. And I'll never forget that uh, photo that got published in Ottawa Citizen, half a page, where the developers and, uh, and, 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 and the members of the, uh, the community association were all four walking through this piece of land arm in arm. And that's what that was the photo was. We never used to see that. But the reason we were able to see that speaker is because they all worked together and they were able to influence the development as a community and the, and the developers were able to respond to the needs of the community and what we will have is a more community inspired development, a wholesome community that will be developed 
intensified because this was green space that is being developed by the Rideau River. It's a beautiful piece of land, but in, in a manner that, um, that reflects the views of the community. Which leads me to the second point, which is, I think, very important in, in Bill 73 and something that my community raised as part of our proposal uh, around, um, around sustainable community development, is that we need more certainty also from, from our city council. That when communities work extremely hard through their community design plan process, that needs to get enshrined in the official plan. That has to become a, 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 an effective, mandatory part of our CDPs. Where you get challenges, and I can tell you some really um, not so pleasant experiences in my community where for two or three years community worked together in, in Westboro and Wellington West uh, neighborhoods in my community where we've seen a lot of intensification. Worked together in developing those CDPs and those CDPs then were ignored as developers came forward and, and put proposals forward. And I won't blame the developers on that. I will say that the city should have done a better job in saying, no, 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 CTP says nine story, not 35 story, and we will hold you account to nine story um, only. And the, the, the solution to that is, is that we should then, once CDPs are developed with broad consultation, that we should make them part of the official plan. And this bill does that through the community design permit system. It really asks that we bring that with certainty and predictability where when communities work together in developing a community design plan for a neighborhood, then through this permit system that's allowed for in Bill 73, that it becomes part of the official plan as, as a secondary plan, and that the municipality then update their zoning bylaw to reflect that change um, uh, that has been established through the community uh, plan, uh, design planning permit. That one change will go such a long way because it's like, it's like posting speed limit. When you say, you know, you shall drive at 50 kilometers an hour, then that's the speed limit and you can go through the speed limit if you do their conse consequences. And that provides the predictability for the communities and for the developers because then they can plan accordingly. And I'll guarantee you, Speaker, is that you will see a big reduction in numbers of, um, of, of, of OMB appeals as, as a result um, of that. Um, let me uh, just very quickly, Speaker, uh, given my time, also talk to you about uh, another important aspect in this, in this bill, and that is, that is around predictability, around 10-year uh, official plan, because I think that's an important step to make sure that there's incentive for municipalities to create official plans. We see a lot of municipalities uh, who, um, uh, who don't renew their official plans accordingly as, as prescribed in Planning Act, and I think a longer time frame gives them that perspective, and having some, uh, a two-year freeze in the, in the timeline helps um, as well. City of Ottawa has been very good in that regard, Speaker, uh, in terms of renewing their official plans, but that, that is an important aspect. The last point is around development charges and, and, and the predictability and transparency and accountability that is being proposed. Especially, I, I will speak in relation to public transit, which is very important to my community in Ottawa Centre. These changes are welcome changes. This is something that, uh, that my mayor, uh, uh, Jim Watson, who's a former member of this legislature, has been, been asking for, and I believe Waterloo has also sought the same type of changes, is that those communities where we've not had had systems like the light rail transit system as we're building in, in Ottawa, which runs through my community in, in Ottawa Centre, that the, the current model of, develop, uh, of, of calculating development charges on historical 10-year data does not work because that historical 10-year data does not exist because we've not had that mode of transportation. That's not the case, for example, let's say in the city of Toronto, which had a, had a, a, a transit system, multi, uh, multimodal transit system for some, some while. So the change that has been proposed that will allow for me more a uh, prospective uh, way of calculating development charges is a welcome change because it will allow for our municipalities to be able to take advantage and take those development charges, Speaker, um, uh, and be able to invest in, in further uh, public uh, transit as well. Um, they, there may be some disagreement between, I know, I understand between the developing communities and what municipalities is asking for, and I know ministers uh, and, and his staff are doing a very good job to bring everybody 
uh, together and ha get some peace in the valley, as they say. Uh, but I think in the end of the day, it's the step in the right direction to ensure that we encourage communities like mine in Ottawa uh, and Waterloo uh, to actually take development, uh, uh, public transit uh, development and be able to uh, attract more what we call um, transit-induced development because we want more and more people living closer to public transit so, t so that they are not relying on driving their cars too often and uh, result in, in better planning and better neighborhoods. Speaker, my time is up. I just wanted to say I'm very excited uh, that this bill is put forward. I encourage all members to vote in support of this bill, something very wholeheartedly that is, that is supported in my community, and we also look forward to working with the minister on his consultation of OMB reform because that's an important work as well, but this is a very good step in the right direction. Thank you, Speaker.